Our laws as it pertain to substances are draconian and bizarre. The psychopaths start this way. He was an alcoholic. Because of social media and pornography, PTSD, love addiction, fentanyl and heroin, ridiculous <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a doctor for <laughs> sake. Where the hell you think I learned that? I'm just saying, you go to treatment before you kill people. I am a clinician. I observe things about these chemicals. Let's just deal with what's real. We used to get these calls on Loveline all the time. Educate adolescents and to prevent and to treat. If you have trouble, you can't stop and you want to help stop it, I can help. I got a lot to say. I got a lot more to say. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for bearing with us. We're a little bit late today. Uh, tomorrow, we'll be on time at 3 o'clock with Kate Shanahan, member of Family Practitioner, ER Doctor, Nutritionist. No, that was Wednesday. Uh, nope, we switched it to Tuesday. Oh, okay. Uh, and we're not going to try to do Wednesday. I've got too much. There she is. Uh, and Kate was the nutritionist for the Lakers for a while. She has a great book called Deep Nutrition. And she has some thoughts about the baby formula problem. And some, and she is not one to hold her tongue. She's got some really interesting ideas. Uh -huh. And she thinks we should be essentially able to make our own baby form. I think that's what she's going to tell us, even though I just got a notification for the LA County Health Department that we are not allowed to do that. And under no circumstances should anybody attempt such a oh thing. Oh, my God. So this will so be So you can't use your, your boobs anymore either, right? But no, no, that's to be encouraged. <laughs> but you can't say that out loud because it makes people feel insu insufficient or inferior who may not have maybe the capacity or the milk production. I so we didn't. can't dare. We can't dare bring it up. I couldn't. So I would have. My babies would have died. Yeah. Well, who knows if you really had to. No, I, mean? I couldn't. Okay. <laughs> well, three of them. Triplets. Was, yeah, are was, you kidding? It was a little Plus, rough. I had no boobs. It was a little Sorry. rough. Why are you sorry? Memory cleanse. Memory cleanse? Yeah. I think you're referring to memory cleanse? Memory glands. Memory glands. I was like, okay. I weighed, I gave birth and I weighed 130 pounds and I had no body fat mm -hmm. and nothing. It was, no, I know they you, sucked you, the life out of me. You gained 50 pounds and then lost but, 50 yeah, pounds on the but table. But I also didn't have a lot of milk production at all. Right. That's right. So there we go. So uh, I liked formula. That yep. was awesome. It would have been a very serious thing for us had we had a formula shortage. Uh, remember, we had, a, we had a garage filled with formula and diapers. And, <laughs> it was really, and diaper poop. Yeah, it was kind of extraordinary. So along those uh, medical lines, uh, we are going to speak today to a hand surgeon. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the medical myths that are out there. Uh, particularly, you know, we've been talking an awful lot about COVID and missteps and mistakes and things done right, things done wrong. But uh, Dr. Alejandro Badia has some thoughts about medical myths uh, and, you know, sort of he has a book called uh, Healthcare from the Trenches. I think you're going to see the book. There it is. So we're going to talk about the trenches. I love the cover of that book. That's fantastic. That's what I feel like all day when I practice medicine, just like that. Right. Um, and Dr. Look how Badia, cute that picture is. Dr. Badia is a internationally recognized hand and upper extremity surgeon. He... Um, uh, let me see where I should start this. Uh, he has a team of orthopedic specialists on staff that treats a multiplicity of factors, very much uh, organized towards walk-in for sports injuries. Um, he'll tell us all about the various... I know what different... that means. Yes, we've walked in with a few of those, have we not? I walked in with a big one. Uh, that's right. We'll talk about that, too. Let's welcome Dr. Alejandro Badia. How are you, sir? Hey, good evening. Fantastic, fantastic. So... So let's start with, uh, well, we'll start wherever you would like. I, I, my head's sort of still in carpal tunnel before we get into medical myths. And, uh, and for people to understand when hand surgeons need to get involved with things and when they don't. Well, I think the point is that our medical system has gotten to the point to where we are trying to emphasize the role of generalists and gatekeepers and this and the reality is if you have an eye problem, you certainly want to, want to come to me. And if you have a hand problem, you, you probably want to get to a hand specialist. And I think that a lot of these myths are propagated by the fact that people often have uh, the voice, uh, don't necessarily have the, the, the in-depth knowledge. And then we have other people making decisions about where patients should go to seek care. So one of the big myths mm -hmm. that, that continues to uh, be discussed is that using a computer is harmful to your hands. And, and it's just there's nothing farther from the truth. Um, yet there's no study that confirms that keyboard or telephone use causes carpal tunnel syndrome, which is a very, very simple condition. It's a, it's a compression of the median nerve, right in the wrist, right in this part. 
And it's a very easy thing to diagnose and an extremely easy thing to, to treat. But the problem is the lack of information has led people to not get the care they need. So I was trained on the Tunnel sign and the Phelan movement yeah. maneuver and this stuff. That's right. And that is pretty rarely, rarely does it fail me, you know, to make that diagnosis. But but it makes it difficult to tell the severity of the problem. Uh, some I, over the years, I've noticed that sometimes, uh, probably years ago, uh, I would say you know nocturnal wrist splints and you know re, you know see how it goes and stuff, and that was I think sort of wrong in some cases because by the time particularly older people are getting to me and really complaining about it, things are pretty advanced. A am I right about that? Yeah, so I, I think that the severity of symptoms will often dictate the treatment. Uh, the initial conservative treatment is a splint because at night, uh, and you mentioned nocturnal, people, uh, when they dream, they, they tend to flex. It's a decorticate posture on the brain. So people flex, and that pinches a nerve. You mentioned the Phelan sign, right? The, the Phelan's maneuver we know is when you bend the wrist like that, hold it, and your hands start to go numb. Uh, there is a, a simple nerve study, and we, we do it in our office. A technician does it. And it takes about eight to 10 minutes, and it tells us how severe the nerve is compressed because the electrical signal is delayed, it's called the latency, or the amplitude or strength of the signal. So one, once those things are at a certain level, we, we know that if you allow this to continue, the nerve will undergo uh, permanent damage, meaning compression that will never fully recover, even when you take the pressure off the nerve. And that's what we want to avoid. Yeah. And that's why patient education is so, so, so important. Yeah, and, and let let's say somebody comes in and has a thenar eminence, a diminished thenar eminence. Is that a sign that you're in real trouble? Trouble in the sense that you may not recover the muscles. So what uh, what is done? And I actually I hadn't done one in a while, but about a month ago I I did a transfer of a tendon. Was a patient. So to explain it to, to the folks, the uh, the thenar eminence is this muscle here in the, in the base of the thumb and the, the median nerve has a branch called the motor branch that allows your thumb to do basically this and that's pretty important right mm -hmm. if you want to grab an object yeah. yeah you know for everyday use so what you can do is transfer in this case i use what they call the eip it's a tendon in the index there's two index fingers uh tendons and you transfer that bring it around and, and connect it here but why not avoid that right if you get if you release right. the nerve in time, you won't have a damage to the motor branch and it'll recover. And the point being is, you know, it's just a metaphor for many things in healthcare is that you really want to get early diagnosis. And I think the move to prevention that we're having in our healthcare system is really going to have a big impact on, on spending, which is at a critical level, as you know. So, so, so prevention will be a good thing or a bad thing? Oh, good thing. A good thing. I mean, if you yeah, okay, start great. to have numbness in your hand, you start to have numbness in your hand. Uh, yeah. Seeing, I mean, your your primary care doctor will you you know usually detect that this is carpal tunnel syndrome, and you can start using a night splint. Uh, by high doses of vitamin B six have have in some studies have shown to be helpful. And if mm -hmm. those symptoms mm -hmm. go away, you may not need a nerve study. You may not need to see somebody like me. But if the right. symptoms continue, you definitely want to see somebody like myself sooner right. than later yeah as long as we're talking about the thumb caleb you want to jump in here with your thumb story with the uh extensor yeah. policy or abductor policy brevis <laughs> yeah yeah i uh so my let me see if i can pull up a picture of of what i'm looking at because i don't even know how to pronounce this correctly but the uh it's this part of my hand right here Anytime, right beneath my thumb, it's an, I believe, an abductor. Anytime this is the way Caleb I'm... gets a free consultation. Just, you know, that's why we're here today, just so you can have this consultation. But go ahead now. This is more so for my wife, because I, if I'm giving her a back <clears throat> massage within five to 10 minutes, I could have been, I could take a break from typing for a week. It doesn't matter. I can do ice. It doesn't matter. I can do hand. She got me all sorts of tools and hand exercisers and all this stuff. So I could keep giving back massages, but it never fails within five or 10 minutes. This mm -hmm. abductor right beneath my thumb, I can't, it just, it's just a searing pain. It's like my whole hand gives out. So what's causing that inflammation or what, what can I do about it? Well, besides 
getting it needing to have the right diagnosis, you'd certainly gave me a good excuse for not giving a back massage. <laughs> I know, I know. Why'd you use it? <laughs> <laughs> so, so the abductor uh, positive brevis is one of one of those thenar muscles that uh, that typically gets atrophied in in late stage carpal tunnel syndrome. Uh, that is not a usual cause of pain per se. So I, I think there needs to be a more specific diagnosis. It's very possible that you have um, a problem at the basal joint of the thumb, which is right at the base. It basically separates us from, from the rest of the simians, right? The, the opposable thumb. And that joint frequently can have, I mean, it can be arthritic. I mean, I must have seen eight, 10 people today. Um, it's more, much more common in, in uh, the ladies. Uh, but you may also have a, uh, uh, an issue at the next joint and it's radiating because typically pain in that muscle itself is, is not an issue. Or you may have a trigger thumb, which is a tendonitis uh, right in the diagram, right above that blue arrow. There is a, a flexor tendon that bends the thumb. And that's an extremely common condition. People have probably heard of it, trigger finger or trigger thumb. And that's a right. tendonitis that a, a, a simple injection uh, will resolve. Uh, I usually make that diagnosis with an ultrasound. Uh, right in the office at the same time. Um, uh, and by the way, the, you know, I want to make the comment that many patients come to the office with an MRI for something like this. I, I can tell you an MRI would not very likely help me. Um, it's expensive. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's just not. It, what's more critical is really somebody who's experienced in treating hand problems to make a careful physical exam and then order the, the right supportive tests. In this case, I would look with an ultrasound uh, but the exam would probably tell me. Right, right. Well, it's interesting that you yeah. mentioned the arthritis part because I have Crohn's disease and some of the medications mm -hmm. that treat Crohn's disease also treat arthritis and also like yes. severe psoriasis, which I used to have as a child. So maybe all of this stuff is connected to inflammation in some way. That's, thank oh, you very you much. Yeah, yeah. Very yeah. Good. yeah, and you go get it checked out. <laughs> you, right, you need Crohn's to get a rheumatoid factor. That's right. Yeah, blood work. I just sent a lady today for that because she uh, actually has had forgotten to tell me. So, uh, message out there to the audience is: you want to be really complete in your in your history to the physician because she had uh, neglected to tell me that she suffered from psoriasis, and and there is a mm -hmm. type of arthritis, psoriatic arthritis that can affect the hand. Um, so that so yeah, we, we, as Dr. Drew said, you would want to get a rheumatoid uh, panel. Where you would what a, certain blood right what, and he's he, he's a, he's a, this is a little more interesting because he's on Humira. You on Humira now? Is that what it is? I, and I so was the, on Humira, actually, Humira, yeah, for like ten years. What are you on now? So I'm about to start a new medication called Simzia, but we haven't. I haven't. I okay. haven't started it yet. So but. you you may have psoriatic arthritis that's repressed by the Humira all this time, which may be why it's only showing up on this one joint. So you really need to get that, that carefully. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. that's the treatment is is Remicade and Tamira and this stuff. And you might actually have it, but it's being treated by the stuff you're taking for your Crohn's. So you really need to get somebody to look into that. That's okay. yeah. It's just wild how so many things are connected. I, now I have three of the different things that this one medication treats at the same time. And I've had three of those symptoms. So it's that's yeah, it's gonna be interesting, interesting. if I <laughs> and then, medication and then, treats them all. And then and then, I mean, what you get, what you've had, Caleb, is classic stuff from our perspective. Right, right. These are all classic <laughs> things. And so he also, complicating his Crohn's, got a psoas abscess that he yep. walked around with for six oh, months. Oh, I you imagine? forgot about that. Oh, yeah. yeah. It, it turned into, yeah, it, I couldn't know. lift my right leg for months, and it was, it spiraled and spiraled until I went MRIs to the MRIs of the, you know, it's your back, all that BS, you know, talk about CBD. See, see, it, but this is to, this yeah. is to the point that we, that uh, Dr. Abadia, Abadia is talking about, is the right people need to do the, the evaluations. You got to make sure the patients get to the right, right people. Right, exactly. Well, that, thank you for well, answering you my know, question. Our healthcare, yeah. system, our healthcare system is not geared to that, and that's really what I talk about in the book, is that uh, we, we, there's so many barriers that uh, and these are the things that we have to eliminate because that will paradoxically decrease the cost of getting care. And the beauty of that is once you decrease that cost, then there's so much money left over to really take care of, of the people who need that safety net. Because, I mean, unless you're a fan of completely socializing medicine, uh, but then again, you probably haven't worked in a VA hospital. <laughs> <laughs> or just burning money. Right. So, 
Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, somebody so on the restream the mentioned physical therapy. Well, so, well, well hold on. We'll, okay. we'll get to all that stuff. That, that's that's sort of we're getting there. Okay. Um, I want to stay with the thumb for a second. Ex explain. You know, I as people get older, they almost always get these de Quervain's type syndromes, and whether it's synovitis or tenosynovitis. Talk to people about that. I, I've actually been a little confused by the. The spectrum of what's going on what there. is We're, that you have it a little bit don't want, go ahead dr video oh great now i have to listen yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. um, that, that's a great word for it it is a spectrum because the, the underlying pathology is, is is kind of the same there is a type of tendonitis that has a hormonal and metabolic uh, relationship so people have we talked about trigger finger we talked about carpal tunnel syndrome now you mentioned decrovane's tendonitis which is uh, the two tendons at the, the base of your thumb. So one, one of them is actually the abductor uh, pollicis longus. So, so it's, it gets a little complicated. <laughs> We've been talking right? about the brevis. Exactly. Yeah. But right, right, he was talking about exactly the brevis. So uh, that the longus and something called the abductor pollicis longus. So that is, um, those are uh, tendons that are constricted with, with this type of tendonitis. And that also can cause what we think of as tennis elbow. So these are all types of tendonitis that are related to uh, changes in estrogen levels. So you see them in, in women in, in a certain age group, and then you see it in men, mm -hmm. usually a bit older. Uh, you see it mm -hmm. in diabetics for sure, everything that you mentioned, very common diabetics, hypothyroid patients will, will get all of these conditions. Um, shoot, women in their third trimester, will get symptoms of, uh, they'll complain of numbness in their hand at night and they'll have tendonitis. Well, people call it mommy syndrome. Decrovane's tendonitis is mommy wrist. Well, mommy wrist is simply and, and the hormonal changes that occur in the third trimester lead to this tendonitis. They think it's from picking up the baby or lactating <laughs> and it's, it's not I had that, you're right. You're, You're right. right. You, and it was, you, you had it also when your hormones weren't right. Yeah, when my hormones. You, I, she'd always be like, ah, blah, blah, blah. But the <laughs> testosterone, too. I think the estrogen, the balance of the testosterone and the estrogen, yep, maybe. That's also. right. That's correct. Because I, when I took the testosterone, I felt better. Back to carpal tunnel. I got a little carpal tunnel symptoms from, we had to, we're, we were carrying around holding babies all the time. And, and, and my sense was, and I would see it in other parents, you know, sort of childbearing age, where it... Is it, it, this is just my own little personal theory, is it, and, and I agree with you about the computer not being a problem, but I feel like holding your wrist against a, a stress or a weight repeatedly may be a risk factor for carpal tunnel. Is that, is that accurate? Well, I, I think there are, there are maneuvers, positions that will bring the symptoms on, but you'll probably mm. find if you stop doing that, that the symptoms yes. will go away, yes. but it doesn't really cause yes. a condition per se, unless, unless, I see. unless it continues, right? And you have a nerve study that shows that you have a real impression, but there, there it. really, it's interesting, the only study that ever supported a, an occupational relationship with carpal tunnel syndrome is meat packers. If you remember, I mean, mm -hmm. reading Upton Sinclair, right, the jungle, that, mm -hmm. that's a really tough uh, profession and meat packers were, mm -hmm. so, were shown to have a high, high relationship of median nerve compression, but that's about it. So it, it really is everything that we talked about in terms of total metabolic. And, and back to the queer veins, I, I feel like although it's, uh, you know, I personally, I, I can, I, I never have a problem uh, getting complete remission with a little local steroid from uh, a trigger finger. Mm -hmm. But the queer veins, yeah. I feel like doesn't really respond to steroids. Is that right? Or at least doesn't, not in these, it shouldn't be in a primary care funny. hands. Well, the studies show that about 80% 80, 80 of people respond very well to a single a single injection. So I think that's okay. uh, the one of the primary, my primary care colleagues that refer to me is because they've done the injection. The patient usually gets better, but then it comes back within a month or two. And those are the ones right. that, that you to release. You don't want to really re-inject steroid. Uh, um, and then I, the ones I see that are just really severe, I say, look, we can do the injection, but it's it's literally a five or six minute procedure. Incisions this big, two absorbable mm. stitches. You use your hand right away. <laughs> you know sometimes we make mm. this big to do about surgery, and that's why I often don't use the word surgery. I, I I'll, I'll tell somebody, look, the surgery is a is a shoulder replacement. Okay, I'm doing I'm replacing <laughs> that surgery. That surgery. That's a right? big but surgery. Doing yeah. a decorative, right, or a carpal tunnel release, or even 
honestly, even some of the shoulder arthroscopies I do, I say that that is a procedure. So a lot of times it's how we label things that will uh, that will lead to a patient's response and, and anxiety, of course. Yeah. So, Susan, you wanted to say something about physical therapy or somebody asked a question about physical therapy. Yeah, somebody on the restream said, is that a good preventative measure? For what? For having, like, carpal tunnel and... No. You'll never get your physical therapy paid for unless unless you have a diagnosis. You first have to have a problem before yeah. physical therapy gets paid for, typically. Right, but as opposed to using, like, you know, medications or doing other well, stuff. So let's do the general topic of physical therapy. I'll let you sort of launch into it. Well, for, for something as specific as a, as a nerve compression, uh, certainly there are uh, colleagues that think that tendon gliding exercises will help, and I think in the early stages it will. But I think if you have a frank nerve compression, I think you have to decompress it. And the problem is we will spend a lot of time and money and patients, you know, we're, we have busy lives and to go and drive to a therapy center and get out, do it, and, uh, and do that for, you know, 10, 20 sessions. Uh, I'm not sure that's a wise use of time. It, no, there's no studies that really show that if you have true median nerve compression, that that's going to relieve it. Uh, you may feel a bit better, um, but it usually is transient. I think therapy is reserved for, for, for where you're trying to recover function and strength. Uh, but I, I'm not sure that that will be uh, preventive per se. I, I think one of the more, I'm, I'm a big fan of physical therapy. I send people to physical therapy Absolutely. all the time. And and I really mean, talented center, physical therapists, yeah, absolutely. very talented physical therapists get get in a ton done. Uh, however, the one joint, well, it depends on a few. Well, I probably have a few things to say, but the one joint that I would say um, there's, I would, I don't think if controversy is the right word, but other approaches, there are multiplicity of approaches, is the shoulder. Is it not the shoulder? There's a lot of talk around the shoulder and how shoulders should heal or how they should be rehabbed. Where do you fall on that one? Oh, I, well, there's a good example of where I think therapy is critical. Uh, I think if you strengthen a rotator cuff, a lot of times there's an imbalance. And if you, uh, for example, if people go to the gym, right? And we do exercises where we're pressing. And every time we do that, we're impinging, right? So there's a bicep tendon. People don't realize there's a bicep that goes into the shoulder. And um, I must have seen three or four cases today of, of severe bicep tendonitis. And therapy uh, in the earliest stages will really be very helpful to that. Or I do an injection. Now there I'll do, uh, I'll do uh, either a, a platelet plasma or I'll use an off-the-shelf growth factors because I, I try to avoid and minimize steroid use. But once you do that, then you want to, you want to strengthen the cuff. And I think that that is critical for, for shoulder whether it be pre-op or, or post-op. I, I personally have had a lot of shoulder stuff and I was reading a lot about hanging and started doing that very diligently. And I'll be damned if it didn't help. Um, uh, if seven years of misery resolved in a week, you know, it's just hanging uh, from what hanging from, from full extension, you know, and, and uh, yeah, that's what I like to do. Able to put both stuff. arms over my head now. Couldn't have done that a month ago. You know, it's crazy. You get something called frozen shoulder. So if you have shoulder pain and you don't move it because it's hurting, so you want to avoid moving it, mm -hmm. um, that's going to that's going to lead to worsening. So what you probably did is avoided a an adhesive capsulitis or or frozen shoulder uh, by doing the hanging. Mm -hmm. um, at first, I thought you were referring to your back because there's a lot of discussion about that, especially the reverse yep, uh, gravity. True. How about uh, hanging from uh, your uh, feet? Like doing it the opposite direction. Um, that that I saw some neck doing but... that. So, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, and your hips. I like I like the Pilates reformer for my shoulders. It helps a lot. Okay, um, but oh, yeah. you mentioned oh, platelet you... plasma. Yes. You, you, I I think you 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 sort of take aim at platelet or, or I think in or at least no. a stem cell. Or take you take stem cell stuff. Well, to, to give me give me a little primer on your feelings about platelet plasma. <laughs> well, I, I think. We have to understand that our body has the capacity to heal itself, right? So when you, you know, have a bruise or a cut or, or even a deep soft tissue injury, right, there's some bleeding, platelets come in, uh, they cause a, a, a cascade of events that leads to the secretion of growth factors that are too numerous to even mention that lead to healing uh, of tissue, all right, and remodeling of tissue. 
And if we have something externally that we can introduce, inject, that will expedite that or really accelerate it, that's great. The, the problem is, is that this has become kind of this cottage industry um, and it's, there's misinformation and it's frankly often abused. Now, in terms of stem cells, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the jury's really not out on that. The, what most of us feel is that the injection of stem cells is really injection of growth factors. So on a, on a mm-hmm. you know, growth factors on steroids, you might want to say, right? Just very, very yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, concentrated. So the problem with PRP is that sometimes you can't, you're not drawing enough blood that once you spin it down and concentrate it, you may not get. So, uh, so for example, when I'm injecting in the hand or the wrist, I don't like to use PRP as much because I can't really concentrate enough. If I'm only can inject it one cc in the shoulder, where I'm injecting five or six cc's, then I can generally get enough volume uh, that I'll, that I'll have a, a positive effect. So, uh, on the contrary, I'm very supportive of what we call orthobiologics, but I think that. We, the public has to be careful about what they're reading out there. A lot of it is marketing. And well, in one of the chapters in a book, I, I talk a lot about this and about really what I, what I hate to call opportunists in, in, in healthcare and opportunists in medicine. And we saw this um, during the pandemic, unfortunately. So, um, yeah. so that, that is a topic. And we're, you know, we're just seeing a lot of, of, of uh, evolution and progress in, in the orthobiologics um, where, where some of the surgeries we yeah. do now are, are not. Well, we were talking about uh, arthritis and, and rheumatoid arthritis or psoriatic. There's a lot less of that because these disease, DMAs, disease-modifying agents, as you mentioned, the Humeras and the embryos, they have an incredible mm-hmm. effect. I, I became a hand surgeon yeah. because of rheumatoid arthritis. My grandmother had that. And I can tell you, I, I mm-hmm. saw my first rheumatoid patient today in the, in the, in the past six weeks. And that's because there is just uh, they're under control now, which is fantastic. Yeah, it's it's such a different. I, you know, I I started practice in the day when they were still injecting gold to get. They had nothing. Right. They had steroids and gold and things right. like that. I was like wild. I mean, that's people, that's you know. Expensive, right? Oh, geez, yeah, and didn't do too much. Um, I have a couple questions coming off our stream here, um, which is. Uh, some someone we know here had bad long COVID, and his long COVID syndrome included a lot of musculoskeletal pain. So I, I want to kind of drift into the topic of, I guess it's really joint and soft tissue pain, but because uh, Susan was kind of tilting at that, uh, and you'd mentioned already the hormones and their effect on it. He got in some sort of program that had a pl- switched him to a plant based diet uh, and an exercise program, and his pains went away. His soft tissue complaints went away. Anything, any mechanism there you can think of to, I, I couldn't explain it. Yeah, well, I, I'll tell you, I'm, I'm, I'm learning myself. I think one of the key things about physicians is that we have to constantly educate ourselves. It's, it's a never ending mm-hmm. process. And I've read a lot about nutrition and, and um, you know, functional medicine, et cetera. And, and there, there is this concept in the public that allopathic physicians such as don't, don't believe in it. or That's not true. The, the reality is, in, we just don't have a lot of uh, training in it. Uh, I remember I had one, um, my days at NYU medical school, we had one hour of nutrition. <laughs> so a lot of what I've yeah. learned, I mean, I had countless hours of biochemistry. So I understand nutrition at the, 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 the molecular level fairly well, but, but the practicality of it, I don't. And I'm, I'm learning that. Uh, in terms of COVID and joint pains, I mean, the feeling is that there is, it's this flare effect that you get from, uh, the virus where the body's trying to fight it. And that's, unfortunately, that's, you know, mm-hmm. there's this, what we call a cytokine storm, right? There's these mm-hmm. factors released that, and, and then there, the, the feeling is that there's this uh, clumps of uh, antibodies and, and the virus that then can deposit in joints in the synovial tissue and even ligaments. And that, that leads to pain. So, but, but we don't, mm-hmm. un- we don't understand that fully. Uh, so we're, we're still working yeah. through that. Let, let's talk a little more about uh, pains with aging. Uh, you know, people come in all the time and say, oh, I've got arthritis, I got arthritis. Most of the time, it's not arthritis. It's, it's a soft tissue phenomenon. We're, I, I, I'm much like my confusion on de Quervain's, 
I'm a little confused about the spectrum of what's going on with the pain syndromes of just getting older too. I'm, sometimes I think it's overuse. Sometimes I think it's underuse. Sometimes I think it's literally posture. I, I, I don't, I, I don't know what to make of it half the time, but people do suffer with this stuff. And personally, I think I get overuse related stuff pretty, much more easily than I used to. That's for sure. Well, that, well, that, I think that's a good thing, right? Dr. Do <laughs> you don't yeah, want to have yeah, underuse. Yeah. I mean, question that so use it or lose it um the, re yep. the, the reality is that osteoarthritis is a condition that as you know we, we don't understand the cause it, it's amazing it is it is the most common malady and uh, i think in the u.s it's been estimated about 60 million people suffer from our way and that is simply a, a wearing down of the, of the joint of the articular cartilage the joint cartilage what you would see in say the, the chicken bone right that white cap and that just wears down for reasons we don't understand uh, but I, I agree with you, the majority of people who come in with pain, they, especially if they're older, they think it's arthritis. Uh, for example, in the shoulder, that shoulder arthritis is not terribly common. What is common is yeah. rotator cuff problems, and that is related to aging in that the belief is that the rotator cuff, the attachment on the head of the humerus, right, that with age, the blood supply is is a little more precarious right so you don't you have little micro tears from overuse or just everyday life and then they they those little tears don't heal because the blood supply isn't very good and that's where the role of the prp comes in is that mm -hmm. when you catch us early you may be able to heal this so the, the pain is not really from an arthritic joint but soft tissue and that occurs in the hand uh, in the elbow the most common cause of elbow pain is lateral epicondylitis or tennis elbow, as, as we know. Um, and that has not, nothing to do with tennis. In fact, I started playing tennis when I was 50. I had no problem with it, and yet I had it when I was a surgical resident. And people would say, well, that's because mm -hmm. you're, you're operating too much or you're not sleeping or you're, you're still going to the gym. And, and no, and my 20 other co-residents didn't have it. So we don't know why some people get this. My theory is that the blood supply at the origin of that tendon, which is the uh, ECRB, the extensor carpi radius brevis, not to get too technical, but these have specific names. And that mm -hmm. micro tear leads to pain. So that that th these are things where early, early diagnosis truly really helps, and most of the times it is not arthritis. Yeah, it, it, and people think it, Susan, so when you keep saying you have arthritis, I think, mm-mm, it's, it's hormones meets That's sleep right meets under and over you stuff. Yeah, yeah, but I liked the stem cells. So she had systemic stem cells. So, so the first thing I want to disavow everyone of, and I'm, I know Dr. Badia will- But it was super expensive, so will I'm, agree I'm with not me on this, recommending. Which is this notion that these are pluripotent stem cells that go to the sixth spot and grow in the same exact location that they're supposed to go to, that you know the, the genetic machinery is guiding them to those brain sites so the Parkinson is cured. No. The only thing I can ever find that it happens with stem cells is, as you said, anti-inflammatory. Yeah, it worked gross, for me. Four months factors. of no hand pain, now, like, no, whatever that tendonitis So Susan had or, systemic stem cells I had no and elbow. thought it was great. It was nice. Now, I, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull the curtain back Dr., before I have Dr. No, Video. it wasn't temporary. It was like four months. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'm gonna. I'm, then I'm not gonna. Because we gonna went give, like in November, right? I'm not gonna give him all the information. Let's see. No, what you he can says give him it. the information. Okay. It's fine. The information is. Or wait, make him let him guess first. No. <laughs> let him guess because he knows how those. Do you know how the stem cells are? How yeah. they, you know, give them to you? They, you know, it's with IV, and then they use a particular thing so that you don't, you don't have any kind of allergic reaction, and then you know. Is that typical of all of those well, those uh, stem cell infusions? I, I think we have to be much more specific. Uh, stem cells are very broad, uh, almost wastebasket term. So, we, for example, in musculoskeletal we had like, system, we yeah, it was like Listening. fifty million cc's Susan, of it's, fetus it's, it's, stem cells or something like that in Costa Rica. But, but the stem cells. Uh, so the stem cells come from areas where there are, right, the, 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 the cells which there's a lot, there's still controversy whether the uh, mesenchymal uh, stem cells from the bone marrow, so it means you have to actually go and, and, and that's not real easy to do. You got to take it, most of the times it's taken from uh, the back of the pelvis, so what we call the iliac crest, yeah. 
uh, mm-hmm. you know, kind of hurt a little bit. But um, and then there's a, a school has thought that the uh, the the lipocytes or the fat cells. So I think everybody loves that because you you know you're getting kind of a free liposuction, but the reality is you're not you're not taking out that much. Uh, you're filling this syringe, and uh, and then there's a whole process to then inject it. Uh, when you're talking about infusion, so IV with stem cells, that's very different because you, you're treating more systemic uh, issues. Um, in, in terms of what I do as, as an orthopedic surgeon is is really typically injected at the site that, that needs help. But the point I was making yeah. is the stem cells, as, as Dr. Drew mentioned, there, there's not this magical, uh, they're not, you know, pluripotential and they differentiate and become, you know, articular or, or cartilage um, and all of a sudden your osteoarthritis is cured. And it's, it, it, honestly, it's a bit painful, I shouldn't use that pun, but to me, to hear this and to hear very well-educated people tell me, oh, I did this and I paid $5,000. Um, and I think, wow, what you did is probably, you know, you really had an injection of some great growth factors and I don't doubt that you feel better. And, and the good thing is that that improvement should last for a period of time as opposed to say cortisol, which has deleterious or harmful effects um, and it will reduce the inflammation, but for a short period of time. So I'm not at all right. uh, bashing this. I just think people need to understand what what the limitations are. Well, there's are. a spoiler what alert. Drew's get? trying to to say he's the, a, he wants to. There, he, there's a confounding variable that she has not yet shared with you, right? Which as part of this infusion uh, to reduce the risk of anaphylaxis or something, they gave her like. Six milligrams of Decadron, 10 milligrams of Decadron, a big old Decadron infusion <laughs> beforehand. And I was like, well, that's why you feel oh, better. Oh, of course, that that's why you feel better. <laughs> plane flight home. It was awesome. Well, I got this right. for free, but it yeah, was that, very I, expensive. And it, they, to, uh, feel better. It's, I mean, it, it, that's yeah. right. I mean, they really wanted problem. to give it to that's Drew. Right. And That's Drew right. refused because it was we were doing a TV thing and it's like Paola he couldn't do it. But well, now we can I do. I just I'm not. Yeah, I'm, he doesn't I, take I, if free. If something bad's like gonna that. happen, it's gonna happen to me. Right, and that's so. true. But I had a really good experience from it. But I mean, I know that the steroids, it's dexamethasone or whatever, were helpful for the first couple of days, and I because I did feel a little kind of woozy and high or whatever. But, steroids. But you know, a couple of weeks went by. I felt really great. I was. He was like, oh, it's probably still the steroids, and then. But then, you know, a couple months, I was just like, wow, I am literally, like, I couldn't barely even close my hands for a while. Like, I felt like I, they were just really hurting all the time. And I was getting massages and trying to, you know, always, I'd have to take, you know, leave in the middle of the night because my arms hurt and my, you know, all the way down to my hands. And it so I'm still wondering what really the diagnosis is. We know what the diagnosis is. Old That's, lady, I guess. I mean, no, I, I was a hairdresser. <laughs> I, I was a cashier. I used my hands my whole life. Like I've always been nothing manual to do with person. it. Nothing to do. And with I it. think it's just old wear and tear on your. And yeah, I raised kids, picked up babies, and I'm always on my phone. It hurt, you know. I'm constantly on my phone. You know, and he's I think telling that you that, that has nothing to do up. with it. Yeah, look, I did, to, I to me, I, I call this the perimenopausal factor. I mean, you know, I have women who come to the office that even in, in their early 40s yeah. and start to have these sort of <laughs> different pains. And a lot of times yep. we use this sort of wastebasket term of fibromyalgia. I, I kind of have a pet peeve yep. with that, but uh, I, I don't, I don't want to get darts thrown at me. But uh, the, I think it's important to make to make a diagnosis. And a lot of times oh, I, when I see people with it, I know all about pains, that. It's so pain. I had perimenopause when I was 40 years old, and I have, I'm now 62. So, um, I, anytime I get my new set of pellets, I feel much better. So it's, right, uh, it's when your pellets are going down. That's when you get all those symptoms. Yeah, yeah, a little bit. But I mean, it hurts right now. It's not. And, I, and didn't you just go for your pellets today? No, I that's know that's exactly but the point. It always hurts a little bit, but I, right. but I did find maybe the maybe the stem cells worked well with my hormone replacement that at that period of time because I did have a really good. I felt pretty good at that time. So I don't know what it did, steroids. but it seemed to be helpful. And I'm steroids help everything. They'll just destroy you. If you, I, if you I wish that they could enough. just give you the, the infusion <laughs> without the steroids. So you could mm-hmm. see if it was helpful or not. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, it's funny. Just today I spoke to a colleague who was uh, hospitalized and they, they gave him very high dose steroids for, um, for a condition. And, uh, you know, he just had to have his hip replaced. He had, um, Mm. Uh, AVN or avian necrosis of the hip. So for the for the audience, that is when the the hip joint effectively uh, 
uh, dies, a head in a femur. It happens in the shoulder as well. And it's related to very, very high steroid use. So you've got to, you've got to respect these agents for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah, true. Yeah, avas well, I don't know. Maybe avascular necrosis. I was in Costa Rica. I don't know how other places do it, but I never. All right. Anyway, we're, we're going to leave that behind. Uh, I know. <laughs> I'm addicted to it now. Okay. It's like... <laughs> hey, by the way, I did not mention we put Dr. Badia's uh, face, uh, Twitter, and Instagram up there. So it's at Dr. Badia, B A D I A, and at Dr. Badia Hand for Instagram. So be sure to check all that out. Or drbadia.com. Let's let's kind of drift into the medical. What, what's the title of the book again? The the, uh, the from the trenches. What you saw from the trenches that you're concerned about? Because God knows I've been in those trenches for 40 years, and uh, I've got lots of concerns. COVID highlighted a whole set of new concerns I wasn't even aware of. What are your concerns? Well, I think the, the overriding concern is is just too many people with their their hand in the in the cookie jar. The, uh, the, the, we need to minimize the interference between the clinician, right? And I hate the word provider. That is a that, that's a, a growing storm amongst physicians and, and nurses and other is is provider. It's, so clinicians and patients, okay? And yes, mm -hmm. we we need administrators. We we need a, a, a lot of other people to run the healthcare machine. But it is just an excess. Um, I think in the, the stat I'd read um, in the last. Uh, 30 years has only been an increase of 6% of physicians. We do have a shortage, but people should know. But yet administrators have increased, I think, 3,000%. I mean, it's unbelievable yeah. the amount of red tape yeah. uh, that there is. And that costs money. Um, and these are people who are, you know, working, you know, very hard. At, uh, but but if you can trim the fat, you end up uh, uh, making healthcare easier to access. I mean, Think anybody who's listening probably realizes, gosh, you know, they have a problem. You think, oh God, how now? Who do I go to? What steps do I have to go through? And that is uh, mm -hmm. that I think is the biggest problem uh, with with the U.S. healthcare system is there is just too many barriers and obstacles to receive care. And uh, well, it's a, interesting a, that we both other, arrived. We arrived at the same place. I've been saying for years. Your most efficient unit is a well-trained clinician and a informed, a caring, well-trained physician and informed, motivated patient. That's your most efficient unit. Anything you do to that, anything creates inefficiency and interferes with the outcome. Anything. Everything else is an encumbrance. The well-trained, caring person who's doing the caretaking, the motivated, informed patient, that's it. That's your unit. Everything else creates encumbrance, expense, problems with the outcome. And I used to, when this started happening years ago, I, I started saying, when they started infringing on the care, I said, look, if, if I don't know what I'm doing, send me back for more training. I love my training. Let, maybe I'll do what, a year or two? What do you want me to do? I'll go back and train. If, if I need a clerk looking over my shoulder in, in Illinois when I'm practicing in California, be, I'm that bad? I do need more training. So please send me back. Let's go. But of course, of course, that's not the problem. And, you know, I don't know how we unravel it. And, you know, I, I worry COVID also shine a bit of a light on this administrative piece that includes the public health part. You know, a lot of physicians now have these masters in public health and they're, they've been locked and loaded and waiting for their opportunity to use that training. And I feel like that was some of the excess in the, in the pandemic as well. Well, let's, let's look at the silver lining. I think that the pandemic has uh, shown us, for example, that the hospital is not the end all, right? I mean, a lot of care can be done uh, uh, much cheaper, more efficiently, less stressful than uh, than going to a hospital. The hospital has a great role, okay? But it's it shouldn't be for for everything, and that we've confused healthcare with hospital care in this country, mm -hmm. um, and and in many places, many, many uh, developed countries. I, I just came from doing surgery, uh, teaching, learning in, in Spain. I was there for ten days. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they have a lot of the same issues we do. Uh, the bottom line is the, the insurance companies, somewhere along the way, we, we are being our fault, maybe allowed them to, uh, to practice medicine. I mean, I think the insurance company's job is to collect the premiums. You know, they make a lot of money, <laughs> collect those premiums, but then pay out. They shouldn't be spending time or money 
in trying to dictate healthcare. I think that they should have oversight because, you know, there may be people say, you know, scoping every single knee pain that walks in. So there, there should be mm-hmm. oversight, but you should have all these, these barriers every step of the way. Somebody comes to me, I, I need an MRI for shoulder pain. I've got to get an authorization. Uh, I decide to inject them. Mm-hmm. I need an authorization. I decide to get therapy for them. I need, I, God forbid, I need to do a procedure, arthroscopic surgery. I need an authorization. Uh, it, it, it's got to stop. And, uh, you know, the subchapter in, in the book is, is entitled Authorization is a Four Letter Word. And, and that's mm-hmm. really the, the, the way. And there is a, a growing. Uh, you know, re- revolution about this. I mean, if you look online, I mean, the physician groups, we are really up in arms about this. And I, I think the patients need to understand this because a lot of times they come to the office and, you know, they're upset about, you know, a copay or deductible or the, or the long waits. All it is, is it's not uh, the physicians creating this. Uh, we're, we, you know, we're, we're with you. We, 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 we went, we, we studied for 10 to 15 years to be able to help patients. And all these other things that, that, that Dr. Drew has mentioned uh, uh, clearly uh, show that they're not adding any value. And it's just uh, really right. detrimental. Yeah, in the and meantime, you have to hire really multiple the- employees. To, you, know, yes. you have to hire multiple employees to, to manage these authorizations and whatever, and the paperwork that yeah. goes with it, and the coding, and blah, blah, blah. And um, yeah, it adds nothing. It adds nothing but expense to the system. It adds nothing, zero. I, I, why aren't they publishing data on, you know, are, are they safe? They, you know, do they claim they're saving money by all these authorizations? Uh, you know what they're doing? They're just delaying it. That if they save it at all, it's because people die or give up. That's, that's where they people save money. Up. And uh, I think that is their actual intent. Well, they're, they're definitely, it's, I, I talk about this uh, just to quickly view the book. The first section really has my sort of trajectory in, in terms of becoming a surgeon, because I think the public doesn't understand. Um, and there's 26 contributors, so it's certainly not just my opinion, but I, I certainly wrote the majority of the book. And then the second section's in chapters. So in one of those chapters, I, the biggest chapter, not surprisingly, is about insurance uh, uh, companies and talks about the fact that there's really very little interaction with us. I mean, every time you go to a, a scientific medical meeting, there's no insurance people there. And yet they, they want to authorize things. So I'm, I'm fine w- with that. But then you, you've got to get educated. Um, and yet there's, and then there's mm-hmm. insurance meetings where they never have a physician except for, you know, the, you know, the medical, you know, their, their medical director or chief medical officer. That's about it. Um, there, there really isn't people in the trenches involved in those meetings. So uh, that, that, I think that chapter many people will find enlightening. And it's just a matter of recognizing what the problems are. The book is not my blueprint or anybody's solution to fixing it. But I think that we do have to better understand the problems before we can sit sit down in, in a room and, and, and come up with a solution. Uh, because uh, if you don't know the problem, you can't fix it. Um, but, you know, my humble attempt and that of some of the contributors is to, is to make some suggestions in the last chapter. And I, I don't want to... Great consensus. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't want to uh, you know, give, give that part up. I, I want, I would like people to read it and and, and give us their feedback. Let's take a quick call here, so, uh, Sandra. I'm asking you up to the uh, podium here at Clubhouse. Uh, if you come up, your hand was up. Uh, you'll be on Twitch, Twitter. I think we're on Rumble today too. YouTube, multiple platforms. Uh, so, Sandra, if you'd like to come up, yes, we're on the Rumble homepage right now. She does so. Oh, how about that? That's, they're, they're treating us nicely over there. Thank you, Rumble. Um, she does not appear to be coming up, so let's uh, bring Josh in here. Josh, go ahead. Hey, Dr. Drew. Hey. Um, I just had a question. Um, I really enjoy this. My father's a urologic surgeon, so mm. I, I appreciate the training and the expertise and the knowledge and the sanity and the professionalism, uh, what I've heard. My question is about what happened yesterday in Buffalo. And the, the reason why I'm asking it here is I want to know if this is something, if your intuition tells you that this is a medical problem. And I, I mean, obviously people would say, well, of course this person's insane. Mm-hmm. But a lot of people have been saying it's guns, he's hate, it's evil, it's hatred, and that's it. Where, whereas from a medical point of view, you might say, 
No, th- there might be something about the brain here going yeah. on. Yes, thank you, Josh. Uh, no doubt in my mind. He'd been evaluated before a year ago, threatening guns. He was he was specifically, you don't get to be in a mental, mental health circumstance without a mental health diagnosis. Much like Dr. Media can't operate unless he has the proper diagnoses and the clearances. Believe me, mental health is exactly the same. You don't get to treat people unless you can prove that they have mental health disorders. And, you know, but we could argue all day, you know, I don't know, you know, there, all, all I would say is the point at which mental health interventions end and the legal system steps in is when people, people are not responsible for their illness, they're responsible for their recovery, their treatment. And if they're not participating in treatment and they hurt themselves, just, or they hurt someone else, well, that's it. You're done. Now, now it's, it's sad, but now the legal system and, and also we can, we can pass judgment on you. We can t- talk about the things you did as, as, as horrible as they were. Uh, and it was on you to do something about that. But the lack of insight associated with mental illness is what we're always fighting. Uh, anosognosia, which is a neurological feature of strokes and mental illness, is, is one of the saddest chapters. Uh, uh, we've just completely caved into that. Uh, and we've, we've just taken the position in most states, in the, in the laws, in the legal structures of most states, that denial and anosognosia is just the rational desire to live life a certain way, which it categorically is not. So that's my two cents. What do you say, Dr. Badia? Yeah, well, well it, there definitely is a, uh, a lack of mental health uh, outreach uh, in the communities. And I think that just like a lot of, of healthcare prevention it is huge. And if uh, this, this could have been, um, recognize and, and, and treat it sooner, we, we could uh, we could avoid a lot of this. Right. But obviously, I mean, you could, uh, I don't want to get into Second Amendment issues, but but certainly, uh, you know, access to guns in, in this country is really, uh, I, I tend to be quite conservative, right. but I can tell you there's no, I don't think there's any reason for assault rifles. And, um, you know, if somebody could well, has a, and also, more of a fear, also no reason, it's different. no reason not to be subjective to an evaluation to see if you are prone to losing your uh, faculties. I mean, I would think you would yeah. want to have be, be uh, anybody would want to not, you know, be accessing a gun if somebody felt that they were uh, potential to do harm. But, you know, that, nobody wants to do that unless somebody really has intention to do harm, in which case they shouldn't have the gun either. And so, so it's, um, yeah, I it just, the, the, or the insanity we have. The insanity we have around it is what I, bothers me. I, I'm, I'm big believer in all of that too, but uh, just having a little bit of sanity around it would be nice. There's so much denial about the brain and how the brain works. That that's the biggest problem, you know. Every and we we have a real problem in this country with things that interfere biologically with the expression of something we call freedom. And there's lots of things that do that in the brain, and where we are, where the this the you know this thing we call free will is not working in certain conditions at all. Uh, whether you believe it exists or not, you know, in the best of conditions is a separate matter. But when people's brains are ill, it does not function right. And uh, people get themselves in really serious trouble. And we're not, and I don't know if you're aware of this, but the, particularly in California and many states, you're not allowed to help people with that. You're forbidden from treating them. If they say, well, I'm, you know, I, I'm Napoleon, I'm Jesus, uh, I'm not going to kill anybody. I know where I'm going to have dinner tonight. I know where I'm going to stay, but I am Jesus Christ. You're not allowed to help somebody with that. So there you go. I thought Josh was going to ask if he had trigger finger. <laughs> so, God. Uh, that's, that's I like all where I your head Is that a bad joke? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I like, I like where your brain went with it. That's a good sign. Sorry. Um, all right. Did we did we cover most of the stuff? Let's see. Let me look at this. Sheet. I've got some a sheet here with some of the things that you're focusing on. Uh, I feel like we did most of it. Uh, hold on here. Well, you know the 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 access to care uh, topic, uh, Dr. Drew, is is one of yeah, the things that yeah. I did to try to try to ameliorate that. Is I started a network of orthopedic walk-in centers. So I think most of the the, the public nowadays knows that if they have say knee pain or or an ankle sprain, they might not go to the hospital, uh, and they would go to an urgent care center. The problem with an urgent yeah. care center it's 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 not staffed by an orthopedist, and if that ankle sprain is anything more than just your routine, very simple sprain. Uh, it may be missed. You may you don't know when you need a walking boot, cam walker, or a cast. 
or referral to foot and ankle surgeon and not and not not an orthopedic surgeon like me. You would need a foot and ankle specialist and uh, ortho now. Um, its goal was to to remedy that. And uh, ironically, we just went to market uh, about 10 days ago. So we are seeking the right strategic healthcare uh, partner or, or, or buyer because we really want to take this national. But we, we, we think that the, the concept of specialty urgent care or or let's say walk in care, because it's, it's not always yeah. that urgent, but it's hard to get in to see your doctor. And with the with the um, the shortage that they're, they're, they're projecting about 120,000 physicians shortage that we're going to have over the coming up in the next uh, uh, decade. That's that's pretty that's pretty severe, and uh, walk-in yeah. centers where you're seeing the right clinician at the right time saves a lot of money and a lot of aggravation for the patient. But I'll tell you, the commu- getting the community to adopt it is a bear. I mean, I live in Miami. I can tell mm-hmm. you whether everything from municipality to large employers to my own, you know, kids' schools. <laughs> I mean, hmm. we have this conversation. It's sort of like, oh, that that's a nice idea, and and it that's so people are entrenched. And I thought that maybe the pandemic would change that a little bit. So I, I, mm. I, I, I do think there's opportunities that will be positive for the healthcare system with, with what we've, been, we've gone through. That is a great idea. And, you know, both of us, I know, are quite aware that people, particularly people with certain kinds of uh, coverage or lack of coverage or from socioeconomic backgrounds, use the emergency room as their primary right. care you there's nowhere worse to get medical care than the er they are there to, they are there to treat emergencies so you're first of all you're not going to get much attention if you're not dying like literally an emergency uh right. and it, they're not trained to do exactly what you're talking about to you know they're they're very well trained i'm not saying that they they're excellent at what they do but yeah, they're not primary care they're, they're not orthopedist yeah. Hey, I got a great doctor at the ER when I was 20. He was a hand doctor and he fixed my knee, but no, you were referred to an orthopedist because you were you needed admission. And that's a whole different thing. But he was a hand doctor. I understand. I understand. <laughs> I understand. But he was great. And I have high regard for him. So, hand doctors working on knees if they well, can do yeah. it. It worked out. Except yeah, that hand kudos. is a hand is a hell of especially and you do microsurgery too and so i imagine you're putting fingers yeah. on and that kind of stuff yeah i want to say it's a better person yeah. doing the surgery because it's more intricate you know mm-hmm. i i that's my let opinion. him talk about it yeah the microsurgery I mean, that, that's you know that frankly that's almost a dying art uh because uh, again going back to the insurance companies you're up all night and if when i tell mm. people what we're reimbursed for these things they, they they simply don't believe us they simply don't believe mm. us i mean my uh you know, a, a diesel mechanic working on a boat would, would probably make more money. I'm, I'm not exaggerating. So the problem is that the training for microsurgery, it's, it's, it's very rigorous. And, um, you know, the, the, the continuing to do this, there has to be support. The system has to support that, that, that kind of endeavor. And there, it, it just isn't. So uh, I, mean, I have worries about where, which way we're heading. Uh, it's funny because we're, we live in a country with so much great technology and, and some of the greatest medicine in the world, but the way the way that healthcare is delivered is uh, is really under fire. So I'm, I'm hoping that- Yeah, that I agree. I'm glad, I'm, it's been coming for a long time. It needs a, it needs a real change of some type. And unfortunately, going to a single provider is gonna be more of the same. It, 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 you know, yeah. You're actually advocating for more market force times. Now, I agree everyone should have coverage. That's a different issue. But, you know, having one monolithic system, just go to the DMV. You want that for your health care? Fantastic. That's what you'll get. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it really it scares me for, you know, we're getting, as we get older, we're going to need this stuff. And I, it's, you know, it, it's not, it's not no, going to be available. I mean, people... uh, yeah, I delve into the uh, training. Um, in the first section of the book, I delve, I delve into the surgical training. And, you know, I, I talk about this for the, for the physicians uh, listening, the uh, if you remember the Bell Commission, right, with the restriction of hours that residents can work. I mean, that's actually been, mm-hmm. in a way, very counterproductive uh, because the continuity totally of care. So these are, and I, I, I so I was uh, around Drew uh, with with that. Uh, I was at Bellevue Hospital when the uh, the whistleblower for all of that was actually in my year, an intern in my year. Uh, so mm-hmm. I have the original article from the New York Post to cover. That said, sleepless doctors. 
And it's funny because if you look at that cover, it's obviously an old man with kyphosis hovered over the surgery. It wasn't a resident. Uh, it, it's kind of interesting. Terrible. Uh, but I will talk about I, that. I never, I never saw, I think learning to focus on what you're doing above all else when you don't feel good is an incredible uh, experience. And to be to have that level of focus through fatigue is also an incredible experience. I never made a mistake because of fatigue. I never saw a mistake made because of fatigue. I only saw people putting patients ahead of everything, no matter how they felt. Right. They didn't. They couldn't go home. They stayed and did the work, and that that is no longer the case. <laughs> and so we'll see what that does. We'll see how that plays out. Well, listen, it's been a privilege to talk to you. Um, again, the book is Healthcare from the Trenches. Do get the book. And again, if people want to hear more about the the new uh, project for the walk-in clinics, where can they go to find out about that? Yeah, the, the uh, OrthoNow website is orthonowcare.com. So one word, orthonowcare.com. And, that, uh, and there's a, a great app they can download. They can go to either Android or iOS, and there's an app called OrthoNow. And you can surf the app and you can actually find out the nearest clinic to you. You can say, uh, you can hit on my way. So literally we know that you're on your way. You can refer somebody and then the clinicians speak to each other through a uh, HIPAA compliant a chat where we share the x-ray and the patient, even though the, the hand surgeon, the knee surgeon, the back surgeon isn't sitting there waiting for you, we, are, we can be aware of, of your, your case. Just like you can order a pizza nowadays, uh, we can use technology to really be informed. And, and, and that is the next big uh, uh, thing that we're seeing is really digital health. And that, that is already transforming how we, we get our health. And I think it's going to be a great thing. That sounds like a great idea because we, we I'm hoping that innovation helps us get through some of these things that we're feeling so bad about because we've been dealing with it for the last 30 years. But yeah, we can, if we can take down the, uh, the the obstacles to that innovation, and that's the problem. We learned what can happen when the FDA now relaxed a little bit and allowed us to get the uh, the, the vaccine in, in record time. So, so bravo to yep. uh, the people on the front lines who did that kind of work, uh, really. It's, it's, yep. Agreed. Although, although in terms of boosters and who gets boosters and things, they've they've gotten sloppy after 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 loosening it in an emergency. They've suddenly gotten sloppy with you know how to apply this. But anyway, separate topic for a separate time. But uh, we thank you for being here. We'll yeah. have you back for that. Yeah, the website is the the Twitter handle is at Dr. Badia B A D I A and at Dr. Badia Hound. Uh, my goodness, I'm tired today. Dr. Badia Hand for uh, the Instagram. And uh, uh, but just it's so nice us. to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you as well. Thank you, thank you. It's a pleasure. As Cheers. Thank you. All right, so Susan, you got some of your joint complaints. Uh, I'm managed. fine. You're I don't have any. I'm fine. I, I, I everything works pretty well on me. I mean, um, you're pretty good. I know. I don't have any problems. You're pretty so. lucky. Yeah, I had a good nap today. It was nice. I, and then the more water coming out of the walls and yes. you have to open up the plumbing again. No fun. Trying to get a lot. Uh, anyway, somebody at the beginning of the stream had a question about whether or not we were still in a pandemic. And I said, ask the question at the end. I don't know if that person's well, still on the stream. Okay. but so the, And I said it was endemic. And then it, they were it, like, I'm so confused. I don't know what it is. And it, then, it is transitioning to endemicity, meaning it's going to be with us always. It's going to kill a certain number of people every year, much like flu or H1N1, which is still around, or all these viruses that they show up and then they just start circulating at a certain level. The, the question is, will it weaken? Will it have periods of spiking? Will it go through future pandemic sorts of, uh, sorts of uh, waves? Mm, doesn't really usually go like that, so probably not, though not necessarily so. And now we have Paxlovid and all these great treatments, so should you get it, there's great treatments out there, please take advantage of that. Um, even long COVID now, I see people are using Paxlovid for that. It'd be interesting to see if that works. So we might do away with that problem. So yeah, it's around. Most people are going to get it. That's what endemicity means. And, and you know, a pandemic is really defined not just by the fact that everyone gets it, but by excess death, that there are excess deaths in that particular year. We are not having excess death from this thing anymore. So I would say that pretty, pretty much puts a, a cap on calling it a pandemic, though I think people are still kind of waiting to see if anything emerges that that uh, changes that. But I think you can, you can, you know, you can bet on pretty significant 
uh, evidence that endemicity, meaning with us, everybody gets it, no excess death, that's that's where we are with it pretty clearly. Um, I'm still mystified by how people are relating to the masks. We were at a giant concert yesterday, and there were people outdoors wearing paper masks. I'm fully endorsing Polly people. Polly has a sore throat today. I'm fully endorsing people using N95 masks if they like to protect themselves. But think, did you see Patty Lupon out there screaming at somebody that she was oh, going to yeah. infect? You don't care about other people. You're going to infect everybody. You wearing a mask does nothing for everybody else. In Remember early on in the pandemic, we talked. No, they to, want. She wanted them to put it over their nose. She was yelling at people I know, because she was. They were going to infect everybody. But, but then everybody on the panel next to her weren't wearing masks. I, I understand. Like, well, they, maybe they were all tested for COVID. But part of it also was you're going to infect us without the masks up here. You don't. The, the, if you remember back early in the pandemic, we talked to an environmental engineer. It's how we met Leopold. He was he was mentioning these questions as well. That pushing breath through an N95 may actually create worse aerosols that go farther, farther. and are more infectious. But we're all so, going to get it anyways. So just we're all going to get it anyway. Get the immunity. And But if you're in a risk category... I mean, it's wanna, better to try to avoid it. If but. you're in a risk group or you ha can't get vaccinated for some reason, you want to protect yourself, please wear the N95. But the cloth masks are just ridiculous. I yeah. mean, the, I, we just had another big study that showed they don't do anything. So let's follow the well, science. Paulina's got a sore throat and she's yeah. in bed. Yeah. And I'm getting her some ramen. Mm -hmm. And I'm wearing two masks. Wear an N when I walk in there. Wear an N95 mask. I, I have to go find and, one. Okay. All right. The, don't, the, the paper masks don't, don't protect you either. I'm using two. So it's the same. Um, uh, let's see. I'm looking at some of your guys. Uh, I mean, comments. I already had COVID. If I get it again, it's not a big deal. Right. I've got a project coming up. I know, so you, you can't go around her. Don't I, use right, her bathroom either. Correct. So uh, I am I'm going to... Even though we had to shut off the water to the rest of the house, you have to go take a shower in the pool house. <laughs> I do? Yes. Is that what's going to happen? Well, you can't go in her bathroom. She's been going in and out of I'll her. happily do that. No. I've got to do some swimming too. You so have to go I'll in Jordan's do bathroom. Do that as part of that. So I am um, going on a hiatus. Uh, it's a top secret project. I'm remodeling... Uh, remodeling the two backup bathrooms and the water is going to be out in our bathrooms because we have another pipe burst. They'll fix probably in the morning, but. So I'm going on a sabbatical or a, or a hiatus for about three weeks, a top secret project. I, I will eventually be able to tell you all about it, but I can't just yet. Uh, I can tell you that I am spending a lot of time preparing for it. Uh, and so that's a part of my stress right now. We have to go to Austin the latter part of the week for yeah, After we're going Dark. Yeah, on Wednesday. Uh, so that will, put, that will be when we stop, and then I go away for a while. And uh, we'll tell you all about it when we can. And uh, it's going to be... Say bye-bye. You'll be back, though. With it. You won't be gone the whole two weeks, I don't think. We'll see. We'll see. That's a, that's a hint. <laughs> that's a hint. Um, and, uh, <laughs> we to go will, to, you get to fly on a really fancy airline. Yes. Too. That'll be fun too. Can I say the name of no, it? No, because that, that will be, <laughs> how will that be a spoiler alert? It has nothing to do with anything. Okay. Go ahead. Emirates. Well, I just worry. Okay. You said it. That's enough. Um, but we're gonna leave it at that. That's as far as and we can I'm go gonna be this. alone. I know I'm, I'm freaking out. I know I'm gonna be You'll, alone too. You might get used to it and then I won't like that. You might get used to it, and you then might I won't. Get, you, you might, might get, get used to it, and I won't like it. <laughs> so, so there. So I know, I'm going to miss you. It's so weird. I know it's going to be a, a challenge, but good for us. All right, let's uh, leave yeah, it at that. Well, tomorrow we are at three o'clock with the great Kate Shanahan. Of course, she's a deep nutrition. She's an excellent biologist. Uh, she limits what she can and can't say to very narrow categories. And when she started talking that way about the science, I knew she knew what she was talking yeah. about. She goes, "Nutrition is." I, I retweeted something yesterday I thought was so funny the day before. It says how coffee works. And it's this, this, this sort of stick diagram, essentially, of somebody drinking coffee. The, docu the coffee goes into the, into the stomach, and it says magic in the stomach, and then energy out the hands. And I thought that's how, that's how most people describe nutrition, some version of that. I know it looks fancier what you read about when people talk about certain molecules and certain pathways. It's, this, it's just as far from the truth as coffee goes in, magic in your stomach, energy out your hand. That's how primitive most descriptions are in nutrition. But not with Kate. Kate has, says very specific things because she is a scientist and there's things she can say and things she can't say. And so I rely on her to give me some things that uh, 
that uh, that we can't rely so on. So what's it. happening so. Wednesday? Because the flight's at to Austin's like 5 40 or 5 30 I think. yeah I, I just have so much to do you've already given so many clues to... now <laughs> if they know the airline yeah, and the time yeah. and the where it's like people can no 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 so. we're talking about austin no, she's talking about austin. Austin. okay okay good good austin, <laughs> wednesday. wednesday in austin yeah so no i can't i can't do anything that day. i can't okay i just can't that's okay with me i'm getting my hair done all right excellent i'm gonna be still painting and and fixing pipes with whiz chris is gonna fly out here and i need somebody with a big buzzsaw can break into stucco on the outside of my All right, house Chris, here, here it is it's your chance i found a guy though he was a lot cheaper i got i got an estimate this weekend and i told him not to come i wish i i just didn't want to spend a thousand dollars to open up some you know five yards of stucco it's so stupid hmm. but i gotta this guy i don't know this guy that's downstairs might be able to do it we'll see all right we're gonna leave it at that we'll see you tomorrow at three o'clock ta-ta Ask Dr. Drew is produced by Caleb Nation and Susan Pinsky. As a reminder, the discussions here are not a substitute for medical care, diagnosis, or treatment. This show is intended for educational and informational purposes only. I am a licensed physician, but I am not a replacement for your personal doctor, and I am not practicing medicine here. Always remember that our understanding of medicine and science is constantly evolving. Though my opinion is based on the information that is available to me today, some of the contents of this show could be outdated in the future. Be sure to check with trusted resources in case any of the information has been updated since this was published. If you or someone you know is in an immediate danger, don't call me, call 911. If you're feeling hopeless or suicidal, call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 800 800- 273-8255. You can find more of my recommended organizations and helpful resources at drdrew.com help.